Hi, uh, I'm Vitor Manfrinato, and I'll be talking here about uh, determining the resolution limits of Ibn lithography. Uh, this work is in a collaboration with uh, uh, my group, uh, my advisor's group, Carl Bergen at MIT, and also uh, researchers at uh, Argonne National Laboratory and Brookhaven National Laboratory. And they also funded this work, and this work was also funded by the uh, US, the, the Energy Frontier Research Center at MIT, the Excitonic Center. So uh, here I want to focus this talk about the resolution limits of eBeam. So I would like to understand the exposure components doing uh, eBeam lithography, how this affects the point spread function, and how this would affect the fundamental uh, resolution limits of electron beam lithography. So basically I want to quantify the exposure resolution limits of eBeam lithography. So to give you some background, as I found these earliest reports of eBeam lithography where they wanted to do some uh, transistors with it. And they used electron beam lithography, as you can see here. They, they picture an electron beam coming here. And here they show a, a, a radiated zone, which would mean that it's, there's an uncertainty of what would be the feature size achieved and what would limit the feature size. And they discussed that, they discussed that feature size uncertainty. And we're still looking for uh, this answer today, what will be the smallest feature size and how dense you can make a pattern. If you go forward, uh, there was some interesting work on simulating the point spread function, which is the energy density deposited in the resist. And here, by this work from Murata and Kaiser, uh, we see that they model the electron energy as a function of distance traveled. And you can see here that as the electron goes and travels to the resist, uh, it loses energy. And they added another thing is that jump from energy from E1 to E1 prime, which means that there was a generation of secondary electron. And they, in, they model the secondary electron effect on the point spread function. Furthermore, advancing a little bit more, you can see here this nice work by Richton and Kern, where they develop a technique to measure the lithographic PSF by doing single pixel exposures. So here will be the PSF, or the point spread function, in the resist. And furthermore, uh, people have been studying and how to simulate by analytical formulas or by uh, Monte Carlo simulation, how to predict and how to model the, this lithographic PSF. And here, what I want to do, basically, I wanted to, I wanted to directly measure uh, all the important effects that limit the, lit the e beam lithography point spread function. I'm going to use as the, my exposure system an aberration corrected STEM, which is a scanning transmission electron microscope that has a really small uh, spot size, a 0.15 nanometer spot size at 200 kV. And I'm going to expose the resist, which is going to be HSQ, is a hydrogen Celsius quioxane. And this HSQ is going to be on top of a silicon nitride membrane, which is 10 nanometers thick here. Then, after exposure, we're going to do a development, a salty development, as developed by my previous lab mate, uh, Zhao Yang. And after this development, we're gonna, I'm going to do a TEM metrology, previously described by my other uh, lab mate, Hugo Duan. And this CM metrology is going to enable a really high resolution uh, imaging of the resulted structures. Here you have an example of the highest resolution features uh, achieved by this technique. Over here you can see two nanometer feature sizes. This, this is a TEM micrograph where the dark area is HSQ and the less dark, uh, the, uh, the brighter. Uh, area, it's a uh, silicon nitride, and you can see two nanometer wide uh, silicon uh, HSQ uh, bridges. 
At the bottom here, we see a, a really nicely resolved uh, 20 nanometer pitch. And on the corner here, we, we see a 10 nanometer pitch uh, structure fabricated by this technique, which, is, uh, which looks fairly better than previous results at 30 kV. And you can see more details about this in this reference. In, we also measured the lithographic PSF at 200 kV, so assuming a constant threshold dose and no chemical blurring effects, we measured the PSF, which is you do single pixel exposures, measure for each dose you measure the radius and plot radius against one over the dose. And by doing this, you get the functional shape of the lithographic PSF. In order to study the effects of the substrate, if it matters having a really thin substrate or a very thick solid substrate, I did this Monte Carlo simulation where I have uh, 10 nanometer thick silicon nitride as doing this study. And I also have another substrate, which is a 300 micrometer thick silicon. As you can see here, the PSF starts to differ only for radius larger than 50 nanometers. So for radius, smaller than 50 nanometers, uh, the PSF on a bulk substrate or on a membrane looks the same. Then uh, my approach is like this. Ba the basic problem here is that once you have an electron coming, coming down inside the resist, there could be an inelastic scattering deflecting the primary electron beam and losing energy, energy epsilon here. And that energy loss it would be due to uh, excitation of other particles. It could generate an electron or a secondary electron, what people call usually. It could generate surface and volume plasmons, phonons, photons, and excitons. And uh, as you can see, this is a very complex problem. And I'm going to focus this study of the, the effects or the phenomena that has highest probability, which is basically the generation of secondary electrons and generation of volume plasmons. What I want to do is to measure the radio distribution of deposited energy for each component, which means uh, I want to see the energy deposited by the direct and primary beam, direct beam. I also want to measure the energy deposited by the propagation of volume plasmons and secondary electrons. First, uh, to measure the direct beam PSF, I'm going to use an energy filter TEM, which it consists on uh, you have a sample on the top here, and the electron, after it went through the sample, the electron will lose energy and is going to enter in the spectrometer here, which we have a magnetic field that bends the electron depending on the energy of electrons. So, depending on the energy loss, this electron is going to underwent, uh, is going to undergo uh, a different circumference. And then you can add a slit here by selecting the specific energy loss that you want to study. And then after the slit, you put a CCD here and you image how the, what is the spot size, uh, what is the spot size looks like after a given energy loss. To give you an example of our measurement series again, our system, uh, HSQ. It's going to be 20 nanometers thick, silicon nitride, 10 nanometers thick. And you have the, the, the incident electron coming here and being scattered by, there's a deflection of electron by a distance r and energy loss epsilon. And basically, I image the spot size, the electrons, after it went through the sample. So imaging transmitted electrons. Here you see how the electron looks like after uh, ele this electron's lost 20 EV. So for a 20 EV energy loss, this is how the spot size looks like after the sample. And I can do this for many different energy losses and see how the electrons lose energy as a function of position. And by using a imaging lens with a achromatic basically using a achromatic imaging lens, I could do a fair comparison between uh, the spot size at different energies. Because in this case, I don't have a chromatic or spheric aberration because we used a specific 
TEM in Aragon National Lab. And here I see, uh, I plot to you the, the average of all energy loss. Here we have the total energy loss in the resist from actually from 5 to 120 EV. And you see how the energy loss occurs as a function of uh, radius, radius position. So this is what I call direct beam PSF. Furthermore, I'm going to study uh, the other uh, components. For example, here, by using electron energy loss spectroscopy, or EOS, I can measure the electron count as a function of energy loss of transmitted electrons. Here at zero EV, we have electrons that didn't lose any energy. It's the largest peak for this sample. And at around 20 EV, I have a, a large peak here. And then after this large peak, where there's a big tail after 20. So what will be that large peak at 20 EV? This is what usually people call the volume plasma, which is the collective motion of free electrons or valence electrons in the case of a dielectric or insulator or a semiconductor that propagate in the volume of the solid. Here I have a schematics from the paper from Ricci where he do a schematics of how the volume plasma looks like. What he plotted is the displacement, sorry, what he plotted was the displacement of electron clouds, electron clouds uh, in the material. So you ha imagine that you have electrons at the center of each of these little circles. And at here, you have a large displacement of electrons. And here, you don't have any displacement. So basically, when an electron comes here, it will excite this collective motion of electron clouds, which has this wavelength, and this constitutes the volume plasma. So we know that the, that collective uh, resonance uh, in nature's Q is at 22.5 EV. It's quite high energy. And we note here that uh, volume plasmas could generate secondary electrons that could further expose the resist. Or this volume plasma could uh, directly break a bond and ionize the resist. So it could directly expose the resist. So we're going to treat the volume plasma propagation as like this. You have the direct beam coming through the resist. And perpendicular to the direct beam, we're going to have a volume plasma, which we're going to treat as a cylindrical wave originated from the direct beam. And I would like to measure how this volume plasma deposits energy in the resist. So here's again the volume plasma peak as we discuss it. And we're going to consider that everything else here, it will be due to generation of secondary electrons. So to measure the volume plasma PSF, I have here a focused uh, view on the use spectrum intensity or electron count as a function of energy loss. So here we have the volume plasma peak. And then by using a Kramer chronic analysis, I could, ex I could calculate the index of refraction, N and K, for electromagnetic wave at many different energies. So for instance, uh, considering an electromagnetic wave at 22.5 EV, I can calculate the index, the N and K. And the K is basically related to, is the extinction coefficient, which is related to the decay length of that electromagnetic wave at 22.5 EV. So uh, I consider that the volume plasma at 22.5 EV decays just like an electromagnetic wave at 22.5 EV. And then I can extrapolate the, basically the decay, the decay length of volume plasmas. And here I plot to you a intensity as a function of radius of how the volume plasma dissipates energy inside the material. And I call this the volume plasma PSF. In order to understand the effect of secondary electrons, we didn't measure directly the, the whole of only secondary electrons in the PSF. So we, we did the Monte Carlo modeling of the PSF, including secondary electrons. 
And a basic question is uh, what kind of model uh, should we use to, to characterize, to, to understand uh, how secondary electrons deposit energy inside the resist. So here we plotted uh, the PSF using in red the inelastic scattering model in Murata's paper. And we also chose uh, to model the PSF using the Moller plus Vriens inelastic scattering model uh, in blue. They have a, a certain difference, and the difference is that the Moller plus Vriens model has a higher, uh, higher cross-section leading to a wider PSF. Nevertheless, we chose to use uh, forward uh, the inelastic scattering model because we, we compared uh, results of lithographic PSF with simulations and previously this model, the inelastic scattering model, agreed really well with our results. So going on, I'm going to try to put everything together here. So we want to understand the energy density deposit in the, in the resist by electron lithography. Here I plotted again the lithographic PSF with a feeding function. And I also plotted in blue the direct beam PSF that I measured before. And you see there's a, uh, there's a quite big difference between them. And this difference is mainly due to delocalized energy transfer uh, in the resist. So you have electrons that went through lost energy inside the resist, but these electrons created secondary electrons in volume plasma, which will propagate and do a, and basically propagate and do a loss in resolution in E beam. Here uh, I plotted the, again the volume plasma PSF, the direct beam PSF, and the Monte Carlo PSF, including secondary electrons. As you can see, that the direct beam PSF around here on the top uh, is the widest component for radius is smaller than one nanometer. What that means is that independent of uh, secondary electron emission or volume plasma emission, the spot size, the spot size and electron scattering, it will dominate the fabrication, uh, the, dominate the resolution of smaller structures. Or in other words, uh, the fabrication of small isolated structures by E-beam will be dominated by the spot size and electron scattering. So what about for a radius larger than one nanometer? Here, uh, I try to compare the effect of volume plasmas and secondary electrons. We measure by EOS that the volume plasmas correspond to 35% of energy loss. And we consider that the other 65% is due to secondary electrons. Then, we perform an uh, energy balanced normalization of these two PSFs. So by considering the, the uh, volume plasma PSF and the spot size, and by considering the secondary electron PSF and the spot size in the tool, here I plotted the energy density deposit by volume plasmas and by secondary electrons. So you can see here that volume plasma has a larger contribution than secondary electrons for radius larger than two nanometers. So what that means is that the volume plasma will, will give you a harder time to make a higher resolution density structures by E-beam lithography in this range. And then here I plotted the lithographic PSF data against the sum of volume plasma effect and secondary electron effect. This is the green curve, and you can see that this green curve uh, has a relative good agreement with the lithographic PSF data. So therefore, for this range from 2 to 12 nanometers, I would say that in HSQ, volume plasma are more limiting than secondary electrons. To conclude, we measured for the first time delocalized energy transfer in electron lithography using a chromatic uh, aberration corrected EFTEM. We also studied the whole of plasmas in electron lithography. We defined the whole of spot size, electron scattering, uh, secondary electrons in volume plasmas. And I would like to note here that uh, the secondary electron PSF simulated 
and the measured volume plasma PSF might be important to uh, EUV lithography, for example, because it's known that EUV generates secondary electrons and may also generate uh, plasmas in the resist. So uh, this study could be also used to understand uh, the resolution limits of EUV lithography. Thank you very much. And uh, if you'd like to ask uh, any questions, you can email me at vitor at mit.edu. And here's the reference of uh, this work that has been recently published. Thank you very much.